Put us down in Matthew chapter 6. And notice really Jesus is bringing a point that he's making to a, a culmination here. But he says it like this in verse 32. He says, for after all these things, what he's previously mentioned, do the Gentiles seek? For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, of course, when he mentions the Gentiles, he's speaking to a Jewish, Jewish audience, and essentially he's talking about the lost world. That is, those that are ignorant of Bible truth. Obviously, today, many Gentiles do know the Lord Jesus Christ, but in context, the idea is the lost world does things one way. But you, those that Jesus is addressing, which would be the believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, should obviously approach life a different way. All these things the Gentiles seek, but he says, don't let that be the focus or the object of what you seek, but rather seek first the kingdom of God. Now, you know, as we look at our society, there are many things in our society that we know do not match up with the holiness of God and His righteousness and His standard. What if we were to choose today and maybe endeavor to come up with what would be the worst sin that a person could commit? Well, I know that some men came to Jesus one time and asked Him what was the first and the great commandment. Even in the days of Jesus, that was a conversation of interest. Which commandment is in most important to God? Well, Jesus didn't say they're all equal. He rather quoted Deuteronomy 6, and he says, This is the first and great commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and mind. The second is like unto it, love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, I would say that if Jesus said the greatest commandment was to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, then the greatest sin would be to break the greatest commandment. Now, if you went to the Ten Commandments, and you said, Well, what is the first of the Ten? The very first commandment, when God said, let me capsize here the law for you, let me put it in perspective of all the law, here's ten that will set you on the right path to know what pleases God and what displeases Him, He put the first one down and He said, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Now, the next one dealt with the idolatry. It dealt with the graven images and actually having things that you would bow down to. But forget the idolatry. Before he ever said that, he says, in your heart, if you put something in front of me, you violated the commandment. Well, I dare say, in a side note, that all of us have violated that commandment in our life. Thank God the Lord Jesus Christ came to die for my sin, for had he not, I've already done enough sin to make me worthy of hell, for I have put something ahead of God many times in my life he's not been first. So now we find that Jesus is not commanding us in order to work ourselves into heaven, because you can't work yourself into heaven. But rather he's speaking to the child of God, and he says, look, the Gentiles are lost. The Gentiles don't know me. The Gentiles are going to seek everything but me, but you're not just in contrast to that to add me to your life. You're to seek me first. Do you realize what God is doing in a very simple way is he is reminding us that the Christian does not make God an important part of his life. The Christian does not consider God essential. The Christian is not to put him up in a high place. But the believer is to put God first. Now, I'll tell you, in this world, there's many distractions, many things that can take our attention, many things that demand our time, many things that are essential to do just to live in this world and to be able to operate, and all of them can be put in their right perspective, but it is difficult today, and it takes the grace of God to put God in His rightful place. He's supposed to be first. What I'd like to do is show you a few simple things about this command to leave you with some thoughts this morning that might help us place it into perspective to put God first in our life. I want you to notice, first of all, about this command, it's focused. Now, the wording of it is very simple. He says, seek ye first. You know, that's a pretty focused command, isn't it? It doesn't leave a lot of latitude. See, it's focused because he says, seek. You know, the thing that God tells us to do here, we don't want to overlook it. We might emphasize the word first, but don't get past the word seek. You know, sometimes we even believers, if we're not careful, and I know the lost world does this, we view God as simply as He is a backup plan. We kind of look at God as, well, I'm glad He's there because if I had a need, at least I know I've got somebody I can call upon. 
it's kind of a, a nice thought to think that I've got a Father in heaven that is looking over me, and if I blow it, He can kind of guide my steps. It's nice to know that if I really got in a pinch and God saw fit to do it, He could get me out of that pinch. All of those things may be true, but God didn't say, just consider that I'm there. He said, seek. Do you seek the Lord? You remember what the psalmist said? Have you understood the heart of the psalmist in Psalm 41 verse 1 when he says, As the heart panteth after the water brook. That is, as a thirsty deer running through the woods, would, and of course in that place water would have been scarce, finally coming on the brook, and as the heart or the deer pants after that water brook, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. You understand the psalmist didn't just view God as a convenience or I'm glad he's there and I feel very reverent toward him and I, I have some very sentimental feelings toward him and I'm glad that I know him, but that's not panting and seeking after God. I mean to seek the Lord. The Bible says in Hebrews eleven six, 6, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Now it's wonderful to believe that he is, but he says and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. You see, before I move too far along on this focused command, I have to remember that God told me to seek him. You see, that is the duty of the believer is to seek God today. Hey, do you do your duty? Now, I understand if a person doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ, they may well seek God. They may be interested in knowing who he is. They may think I'd like to have a connection with him. In fact, the Bible commands in Isaiah 55, 6, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Certainly, if you don't know the Lord today, it would be a wise thing for you to go seek Him, to know Him for salvation. But He's speaking here to the believer, reminding us that we are to not just do it first, and not just the kingdom of God, but the activity, our duty, is to seek Him. You know, I think that's one thing as believers we often miss out on. We need to cultivate a relationship with the one who saved us. Hey, when you begin to get to know Him, and you begin to connect with him, and he begins to teach you truth from this book, when you begin to see him answer prayer, when you sense his presence and his nearness, you begin to want to place him in his rightful place. Now, I see the duty, but then as I look at this focused command as well, I see the direction. Because it's clear, it doesn't just seek the Lord, but it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, obviously, I'm to seek the Lord himself, but he's saying, when I put it on a practical level, how do you do that? It's easy to say, well, I put God first. That's talk. It's easy to say he's, he's number one in my life. He's preeminent. But he puts it here on a practical level and says, well, if he is, then here's what you ought to seek, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, when I seek the kingdom of God, I think, first of all, the first grabs me. What does it mean when you think of something First, well, that's a priority. How do you make God a priority? Well, it comes down to decisions that you make in your life. Again, it's easy to say he's first, but does it practically show itself in decisions that you make? You say, well, I believe God would be greatly pleased if I could give this up for him. Or if I would go so far as to maybe give a, a sum of money for him. Or maybe I've offered to, to offer some of my time for him. And that may be great, but remember 1 Samuel 15, 22? Has the Lord a great delight in sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to hearken is better to sacrifice and to obey better than the fat of rams. See, it comes down to me making decisions that decide, not only do I say God's first, but when he comes down to it, I put him first. Now, how do we decide that in our life? Well, you think about, first of all, how a person gives. You realize when a when a person who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ approaches giving to a charity, how do they view it? Well, you know what? I'm so blessed. I have so much abundance that I give out of my abundance, and I realize I ought to help some folks that aren't as well off as I am. That's how you give to charity. Nothing wrong with that. Do you realize that the believer doesn't give that way to the Lord? First of all, we don't give merely out of need. We don't give because we say, well, there's a great need here. It's a void. If we don't step up and meet it, nobody's going to meet it. There may be option, opportunities to give in that way, but a Christian gives first and foremost because it's right to give. We don't give out of our abundance and say, well, I sure hope I got a little left over so I can give. The Christian says, I give first. That's how the tithe works. The tithe comes off the top. Now, I'm not simply focusing this morning to try to preach a sermon on giving, 
But I'll tell you, it often demonstrates our heart, and he does deal with riches in this chapter, which we'll get to in a moment. And many times, it's a good gauge of our life. When I put him first, often one of the first things he gets a hold of is my pocketbook. So he's first. But it doesn't end there. Because I don't doubt that there's some believers this morning who probably immediately, amen, that's right, give first, I do that, and then I'm off the hook. Well, again, that's a, in a sense sacrificial. It's really right. We give. We give our tithe. But God also wants some obedience in our life. Isn't it remarkable to the type of decisions that we make sometimes today? I mean, here's a person who looks at uh, church as a convenience. I mean, they come up with just about any excuse they can not to show up. Uh, we got sickness, COVID's out there, boy, that's great. We still got it. I hope it'll lay out as long as it can so we'll have a good excuse not to show up, not to be there. Oh, I can sit in Pajama Baptist and watch live stream and do my tip and eat some ice cream or cereal while I get along. Thank God we've got it. Thank God people can see it when they can't come. But I have seen people use it as a crutch not to be in the house of God. God didn't say, don't forsake the watching of live stream. He said, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as believers. Do you realize you've got folks today, they love God, they genuinely want to serve the Lord, they're serious about their Christian life, but they'd almost put anything against assembling in the house of God. Now, here's a, here's a young person who wants to make a decision for his life. He's a Christian. He's on his way to heaven. He's seventh, eighth grade, ninth grade, whatever it might be, and he starts thinking, what am I going to do as a profession. Well, you know, there's plenty of lazy bums that don't want to do anything. So I wouldn't discourage a kid who says, well, I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a doctor. I'd like to be, you know, some other lucrative, uh, some type of professional, whatever it might be. Nothing wrong with that. You ought to think, how am I going to make a living? But that ought not be the first question. The first question ought to be, what is God's will for my life? If God wants me to do it, I'll do it in spite of what it pays. Now, we can go chase the American dream today. That's what the Gentiles do. And, hey, I'm a Christian, and I still enjoy living in America, and thank God this is a blessed nation, and I glean from that. I give God the glory for it, but it better not be what controls our life as a Christian. I mean, it's remarkable to me. Here's a parent raising their kid for God, and they're sending them a message. Church is very important. God is very important. But it's not as important as a baseball game or a football game or an athletic event. No, he ought to be first. Hey, some things come up. Sure, I mean, we are providentially hindered. Sometimes there's unique situations where you're thinking, boy, this is a tough decision. I'm not sure what to do. But if you don't know what to do, then give God the benefit of the doubt. And you'll come up on the right side. You see, he is saying, don't just put God high. Put him first. It is a priority. And then also... It concerns our promotion. You see, if we're going to stick him and in the, in, in the kingdom of God and his righteousness, it comes down to who we're going to promote. You know, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, those Corinthians who had a number of problems, they were uh, going to law with one another. We well know, most people know, Christians aren't supposed to sue each other. And of course, that's where it's introduced in the Bible. They would have a legal suit right there in the midst of the same church. And instead of trying to settle it between themselves. Hey, I'll just take you to law and I'll get this thing settled. Well, the whole lost community was watching this thing and laughing at the church. Isn't that something? Here's a bunch of unified Christians that are suing each other, can't even get along. Paul wrote and rebuked them. And he says, look, can't you even judge the smallest matters? Don't you know believers are going to be used to judge the world and you can't even judge the side what you're going to do if this one guy broke the chariot wheel on yours with his lawnmower or whatever it might be? I mean, just silly stuff. And you know what he says over in 1 Corinthians 6, I believe it's verse 7. He says, why don't you rather suffer yourself to be defrauded? What would be the worst? What if somebody uh, did you wrong and they ended up getting away with it and you didn't get your day in court, and they ended up getting one over on you, would that be worse than the name of Jesus being dragged through the mud? I mean, if you had to choose between the two, which one do you want? He says, why don't you rather than hurt the name of Christ, suffer yourself to be defrauded? What would happen if we as believers today were so serious about the name of God, so serious about the cause of Christ, we say, boy, I'd rather suffer some loss than actually his name be dragged through the mud. But we got to put him first. I remember Jeremiah chapter 9. It says, let not the rich man glory in his riches. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. It says, but let him glory in this, that he knows me and understands me. 
I am the Lord that exercise loving kindness. That's what our glory ought to be in today. Do you realize we have a greater cause today than our comfort? We have a greater cause today than we get our day in court. We have a greater cause today than <clears throat> I get my rights. We have the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is a focused command to seek first. I mean, he tells me the kingdom of God, the direction. But then, when I seek the kingdom of God, yes, I have a cause, and yes, there's a priority to it. But what about my presentation before people? Now, think about it today. The Bible says in Romans chapter 14, for instance, it says, Let not your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God, remember he mentions that here, is not meat and drink, but joy and peace in the Holy Ghost. He goes on in verse 23 and says, Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Now here's a person who seeks God first and puts him first, and he's got some decisions to make. Because remember, it comes down to my daily decisions of obedience. I'm going to have to decide. And often the Christian says, well, you know, I don't really know what the real problem is with this particular activity that the world does. And I'd like to engage in it. And I don't really know that you could show me chapter and verse why it's wrong. So I'm going to do it. Well, the attitude of the believer <clears throat> who puts God first is the other way around. I want to make sure that God's pleased with it so I can make sure I'm presenting myself properly. You know, here's a person who says, well, I think it's all right to drink beer. As long as you don't get drunk, as long as you're not a, you know, God's condemning drunkenness and so forth. Doesn't the Bible say drink a little wine for your stomach's sake? Actually, it doesn't. But often they'll bring something up like that. The attitude of that person, if they know the Lord Jesus, is this. Look, I don't know that you can really tell me if, a, if I get drunk with a beer and a half, then surely a half a beer is okay. Just how much could I drink and it be okay? Well, first of all, I'd ask you this. If there's an alcoholic who couldn't drink anything, if he drank to swallow of it, he'd go right back to his alcoholism. Why don't you as a Christian set the example and say, I'm just going to not touch it at all. You see, he that doubteth is damned if he eat, so whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Here's somebody who says, well, you know, just how many cuss words, how many bed scenes is it okay for me to watch this Hollywood movie? I mean, can you show me chapter and verse? Well, perhaps I could, but why not say, God, what do I need to do to make sure my testimony is vibrant and protected? Now, those lines may differ for each one. That's possible. You might draw a different conclusion. But my, my uh, thought today is not so much your conclusion, but the reasoning of how you got there. Yeah, we could have some different standards. We could approach things different ways. But what I find when I hear somebody trying to excuse away worldly activity, they try to excuse away something that clearly is not a testimony for God, what if I looked at it and says, you know what, I'm going to give God, not the devil, the benefit of the doubt. Now, here's a tragic situation. Let's suppose you get to heaven one day, and you heard the preacher, you know, get up and condemn the beverage use of alcohol, and you said, boy, I don't know, sometimes I drink half a beer, and I think I'm just going to give it up because I just don't know if that's right. What if you get to heaven one day and find out that God was okay with you drinking half a beer? Don't you think that's going to bother you for all eternity? Or do you think God might say, well done, my good and faithful servant. You gave me the benefit of the doubt and not the devil. I mean, the whole issue is how much is that activity worth to you to take a chance on displeasing God? Because you've got to admit there's some questionable activity out there. You say, well, that's a gray area. Well, if it's gray, why don't you just leave it off and stay with the white? I mean, the presentation that I have is going to demonstrate if he's first. Because God's supposed to be first. Now, the priority of this, I mean, God has put this in front of us as a, as a definite decision that we make. But then notice a phrase that he uses here several times. And this same idea, it's a focused command. Look down, if you would, to verse 25 of this chapter. It says, therefore I say unto you, take no thought. And then in verse 27, he says, which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And in verse 28, why take ye thought for raiment? And then look at verse 31, therefore take no thought. You know, clearly there's something going on when God builds up to this command and says, okay, the way to cure this is to seek first the kingdom of God. Multiple times he said it's a thinking problem. Because here's what I believe. If you really know the Lord Jesus Christ and you, the Spirit of God takes this truth and reminds your heart today that he's supposed to be first, not any true believer is going to argue with that. 
Nobody who knows Jesus today says, well, preacher, you're going a little bit too far. I don't think he ought to be, I mean, first, he ought to be up there high and important. No believer would say that. As a believer, you'd say absolutely. Now, I don't always put him first, but I have to admit, yes, he's supposed to be. By God's grace, I'd like for him to be. So really, why isn't he? I tell you, a lot of times, it's distraction. We're distracted. And God says we ought to get control of our thoughts. Now, I'm not talking about even thoughts about moral issues. He says, take no thought. We spend a lot of times spinning our cognitive wills with stuff that we cannot control. And it causes him to take second place. I was driving one time. Unfortunately, this has happened multiple times, but I'll just give you one instance. But I was driving one time to Georgia. Now, you can go down 17A and, you know, jump on 95 going through Waterboro. Or you can take the interstate out to 95 if you want to go all the way and take 95 south to get to Georgia. You don't even need a GPS to do that, okay? I've been to Georgia many times. My family all jumped in the car. <clears throat> this was back when we were living in Moss Grove, I believe. Made our way down. Got off 17A, hit 26. I decided that day, I said, I'm going to hit uh, the interstate because 17A looked real backed up through Somerville. I said, I'm just going to go out to 95 and take it. I got on I-95. I'm traveling along. Uh, the kids are doing their thing. I'm talking to Elizabeth some. We're just traveling along, and all of a sudden, I see the sign for Columbia. Well, let me let you on in a little secret. Columbia is way past 95. Now, why did I miss I-95? You say, well, the, it's a hidden exit. You can barely find it. No, it's a big old clover leaf that with an A and a B and big signs as big as the middle of this church, I-95. How could I miss it? Because my wife wouldn't tell me where it was. No, it's <laughs> because I was distracted. Now, my wife will tell you, I can drive an autopilot. Um, I don't have a Tesla. I have my hands on the wheel. I'm obeying the rules of the road, but I'm thinking about other things. I wish I could say that was the only time, but she could tell you a few times when we were traveling, and she asked me, are we going the right way? Well, of course we, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, we got to turn around. <laughs> I pulled off the exit, took the wrong one, going the wrong way. Thank God she was with me. I'm liable to be in California right now. <laughs> but I'm easily distracted because I can get focused on something. I can start thinking about it, whatever it might be. And I'm I'm seeing stuff with my eyes, but my mind is somewhere else. I don't want to hear an amen over here. Okay, I'm <laughs> distracted. Now, that happens, and you know it causes some trouble sometimes, doesn't it? it? It gets us in trouble. But I'll tell you, when you get spiritually distracted, it's easy to get distracted by a job. you got to work a job. You know, I go out here, and I see these panhandlers. I will work for food. You just passed 20 signs on the road that says now hiring, and now I see a guy that says I'll work for food. Well, that fast food joint back there is hiring. Maybe they'll feed you if you go work for them. I wouldn't want to buy anything if you work there, but, I mean, you know there's a, somewhere for them to work. I mean, we're not trying to say let's just be old lazy bums, and all we think about all the time is just spiritual things. No, go to work. Be disciplined. There's some important things in life, and it is part of making a living and taking care of your family and being a decent citizen, but it can't be the number one thing. You see, you start by putting him first and then let God take care of the rest. We can get distracted by a job. We can get distracted by taking care of our family. It's very important to take care of your family. A person can even say, well, I want to spend time with my kids and I want to make sure I've paid attention to my wife and I'd like to make sure I'm making a decent living. And somebody says, where's that guy? I'd like to find him. But anyway, uh, we do. We have those responsibilities, right? And those are important responsibilities. Well, how in the world am I going to do that and put God first? No, the question is, how are you possibly going to do that if you don't put God first? He's got to be first in your life. So it is a focused command. But then I want you to notice, secondly, it's a fruitful command. Look at verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, that's the focus, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, the all things, you could go clean back to verse 19. Lay up not for yourselves treasures upon earth. You could talk about treasure and riches. And um, I'm not going to say that's invalid. All that context is all of these things the Gentiles seek. All of these things the Gentiles are trying to seek. Riches and uh, putting away for a long time. And he, he condemns the, the, the focusing of riches. You could throw that in there. But really the focus is what you shall eat. 
what you should drink, and what you should put on. Because notice back, if you would, in verse 31. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, the these things, again, are those for sure, and maybe even going back to the riches. But then notice the contrast here. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, in verse 33, and his righteousness, and all these things, the same ones, shall be added unto you. You see, if you keep this command, this focused command to seek first the kingdom of God, do you realize that command is a fruitful command? These things are going to be added unto you. Now, I can't be exhaustive today, but let me give you a couple of thoughts about what might be added. What comes today as a result of seeking him first? You know one thing that he'll give you? Peace. Oh, pre preacher, you, I thought you were going to say he's going to give me uh, uh, some help with the stock market or my, my bank account's going to get bigger. Now, God may bless you. He does. But which one you rather have? Peace or a purse? You'd like both. I get it. But the peace is invaluable. I mean, the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 6 that it is a gift of God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God. That means God has to give it to you. You know how it comes? By taking no thought. You see, when you don't take thought, he used the illustration of your height. Take no thought. Who, by taking thought, can add one cubit to his stature? I mean, let's just imagine uh, my son Noah is out taking on Stone Fox on a you know on a one-on-one -on -one basketball. And he begins to realize pretty soon that Stone has a great advantage over him. And he starts thinking to himself, man, I want to be that tall. And so every day for 30 minutes he meditates and says, I'm gonna grow. I'm gonna grow. It's gonna happen. Now you can do that if you want. You know as well as I do, you can't add one cubit. Now he tries from as much as he eats to see if it'll work, but that hadn't worked either. But you can't make yourself grow. I mean, it can't happen. I'll put it this way. You can't make yourself grow vertically. You can't get taller. You can't add a cubit to your height. You're just thinking. You're spinning your wheels cognitively. So what does God command us to do? He commands us over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. You say, boy, that's tough to do. It's tough to get a troll, you know, not think about that. And you're right, it is. That's why God had to command us and also told us it was a spiritual battle. He says, for we walk not after the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. That's an effort, isn't it? Casting down imaginations. My mind can run wild. I can think of things, all the different scenarios that might turn out. And it's not you can turn it off like a switch. The brain is difficult to control, casting down imaginations and bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. That takes the grace of God. Now, when I do, and I put him first and place him in the right place, what does God do? <clears throat> Isaiah 46, 3, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Now, again, it's not like turning on a switch and say, okay, well, if I just quote a verse, I'll have peace. No, it might be that God's grace has got to begin to work and show you things, and you've got to learn to trust him. It's a process. It's exercise. The Bible says, exercise yourself rather unto godliness. But the fruit, what it will produce, is something the world cannot give you, and that's peace. Do you believe this book? God can give you peace. He can give you peace with God through receiving Jesus, and he can give you the peace of God when you give it to him. Well, you know what else he'll give us this fruit? He gives us productivity. According to John 15, you have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That whatever you should ask in my name, I may give it to you. Imagine the believer who puts God first, who maybe before was taking thought about what am I going to eat? What am I going to do? What's my raiment? Uh, am I going to be comfortable? Are my kids going to be able to be popular like everybody else? Are people going to think they're out of place? Are we going to have enough money to make sure that they don't have the wrong kind of clothes? All this stuff is going on in my mind. I've, they've got to be famous. They've got to be popular. I mean, what if they end up working and don't make all this money? <clears throat> all that stuff can take your mind. But suppose you just give it to God and let God produce through you eternal fruit. 
What's really important? I mean, really, what if your kid ended up making uh, Tesla look sick and earn more money than them? Your retirement might be a little bit better, but what if that happened, or what if one of your kids turned out serving God on the mission field, or pastoring a church, or an evangelist, or married and supported a preacher, or whatever it might be? How much is that worth? Productivity. Now, not everybody that's right with God, get me, not everybody who's first, their kid's going to end up in the, in the ministry on the mission field, but I'll tell you what, to be able to say, God, these kids are yours, would you use them in whatever way you want to use them, whether they live in a place and help a church plan or get a church started as a layman, or whether you send them out to a mission field, or whether they're just a faithful church member somewhere that reaches people for Christ, God, would you use them? Hey, that's productivity. That's eternal. You can't buy that with money. Now, God gives peace. He gives productivity. But you know, when I think about the fruit, I can't help but think about the pleasing. You know, it comes down to this. What, how much value would you place on hearing from God, well done, thou good and faithful servant? I mean, when it comes down to it, I'd rather have God say, well done, than have the world say, boy, I'm impressed. Look how successful that person is. Look what they've accomplished. Wow, my... Uh, kids famous, or wow, look at the bank account I have, or look what I've been able to do. Nothing that this world could give you for the believer would be worth well done. So this command is focused. This command's fruitful. But let me close by saying this command is foreign. Now, what I mean by that is mentioned in verse <clears throat> 32. After all these things do the Gentiles seek. The Gentiles were foreigners, their mind was completely different than this. What I'm telling you today, the world looks at and says, man, I, I mean, I understand you can get into God and you can be religious, but that's fanatical. That's because it's foreign to them. Shouldn't be foreign to the believer. Now, when I think about it being foreign, do you know what I find from the world, and this goes back to the previous passage, is they have a false reliance. Let me read quickly, if you would, look at verse 19. <clears throat> Jesus said, lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye, and if therefore thine eye be single, that's focus, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, that's distracted, Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, if it's distracted, how great is that darkness? Who knows where that distraction will go? No man can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, else he will hold to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon, of course, being riches. You can't have two masters. Now, why would he have to tell people this? Because the world assumes that the most important thing in life is treasure. Where your heart is, or your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The world just assumes, and, and it is necessary. You got to eat, you got to live somewhere. I mean, time in people's minds is one of two things. Either time is life, or time is money. I mean, that's what takes our attention. I mean, that is, it is a very, it grabs our attention. So what happens to the world? Why is this truth foreign? Because let me tell you how the world views spiritual truth. They have a false reliance on riches. Even if they wouldn't admit it this morning, if they think about it, they're relying on it to some extent. Do you know what riches cannot do? Riches cannot redeem. 1 Peter 1.18 for you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. There's no amount of money that can take away your sin. People aren't necessarily fooled by that. <clears throat> I think most people know deep down, how in the world would you ever buy your way out of sin? And yet there are people that feel like I've done enough, and boy, if, I, if you're wealthy enough and you've got enough comfort and uh, you, you had enough riches to be able to take care of it, it's just hard to imagine a man with all that money could die and go to hell. And yet the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. 
There was a man in the Bible, the rich fool, who said, look what I've done. I'll build greater bar barns, and man, i got much goods laid up for many years. And God said, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Over in Psalm 49, he says that by the multitude of riches, no man can by any means redeem his brother. Money cannot buy redemption. You say, well, what can? The blood of Jesus Christ. You see, you've violated the command of God, and I have too. We've not put God first. We failed in his command, and you just start right off with the first one. We haven't placed God where he goes. I mean, the Bible goes on to say, don't bear false witness. We've lied. It says, don't commit adultery. We've been immoral. It says, don't be covetousness, and we've lusted after other things. I mean, go on down the list. We've failed God, and no amount of money will take away your sin. No amount of good works will take it away. No amount of effort, taking thought won't take it away. But the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. It's available. Jesus died. He took my sin upon himself, came out of a grave, and made a way for a person to be saved. And in the world's mind, it's foreign, but to us, we understand they have a false reliance. They're relying on money to buy their way into heaven, and it can't do it. But let me tell you what else it can't do. It can't satisfy. Now, it can't get you to heaven eternally, but it can't even help you right now with the least spiritual problem you know a person comes up to a dilemma they say well you know here my kid uh, can't get into this college or I'm not able to keep this job or I'm going to be having to move because of this boy money would solve my problem you'll find out real quick money will not satisfy you it won't solve problems many times it creates them you know the Bible tells us over in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11 that God has placed eternity in our heart now, there's something missing in there. There's a void. Get it. If you don't know Jesus today, you know something's missing. You think, well, I'm religious. I'm a church member. I'm familiar with things. But there's something inside that's not there. It's God. He's the only one that'll fit. You can try to satisfy it with lust. You can try to satisfy it with money. You can try to satisfy it with popularity. All these things that your flesh says, boy, that sure would be fun, but it will not fill the deepest need of your heart. And certainly money can't do it. See, your, your treasure is not going to redeem your soul and it's not going to satisfy your soul. What is it? Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the uh, sleep of a laboring man is sweet and yet the riches or the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. You know, here's a guy who's got really not much. He works a job. He makes a living, pays his bills and doesn't have a super abundance. Now, there's no premium on uh, being a bad steward and wasting money, but I mean, just hadn't had good opportunity, but he works a job and he pays his bills. He goes to bed at night, sleeps well, gets up the next day, made an honest living, goes and makes another one. Here's another guy that's not necessarily dishonest, but he's hit it big. His stock just quadrupled in the last year and he's got tons of money. You'd say, well, boy, I bet he goes to bed at sleep at night and with ease. No, he's wondering, I wonder if that stock's going to go down. I wonder if it'll, when I get up tomorrow, is that this going to happen? It, his abundance won't even, what if somebody stole my money? What if somehow it isn't worth what it used to be? And his abundance won't allow him to sleep. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. Even a wealthy man could trust God and say, God, just like Job did, you gave it, you can take it, but it will not suffer him to sleep. So it can't satisfy, it can't redeem. I got to move quickly. It can't bring joy. You know, you say, oh, I don't know about that. You give me a bunch of money, I think I'd be overjoyed. No, you'd be happy. But it can't bring joy. Joy is different. Let me tell you what can. Psalm 119, 162. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. You know, it takes a spiritual mind that God saves to recognize that this book that I have in front of me, and this isn't just rhetoric, what I find in this book is more valuable than any amount of money in this entire world. This book has answers. I rejoice at thy word as one that findeth great spoil. Now, they have a false reliance. Are you relying on riches today? Do you think they'll make you happy? Do you think they'll get you to heaven? Do you think they'll make you closer to God? Do you think that, that's a, that, that it all culminates? Yes, I know God's important religion's up there, but boy, I'm telling you treasure. Jesus is condemning it as a false reliance. But you know, it's also foreign because it causes a failed rivalry. There is a rival for the throne today, the throne of your heart. There, there's two, two 
I say not persons, but one's a person, but two rivals going after the throne, God and self. That's what mammon is. It's riches, but it's basically what I can get. Do you know, you can't automatically say, well, God's going to win because he's, no, God could, but he's chosen to let you make the choice. There's a rivalry. They're competing for the throne, and he says clearly, I will not set up there with it. We won't take that throne together. Money would be fine with that. Sure, I'd be glad to let God come up with me. No, but God says, I won't. You cannot serve both. There's a failed rivalry. Could it be today there's somebody who loves his money so much, loves his riches, it might not even be you have any. It might just be the desire to have them, but you love them so much that you'd say, I'll die and go to hell before I give them up. Well, you, God will let you do it. But if you'll say, God, nothing's more important than you. Nothing is more important than my having you take away my sin and make me fit for heaven and I'll turn to you. That's what repentance is all about. You change your mind. You turn to him. Years ago, there was a man, I don't know exactly when this happened, I think maybe in the 90s, but a fellow named Billy Bob Harrell. Now, does that sound like a man from Texas? Okay, he was from Texas. He won the Texas lottery and won $30 million. Changed his life for the worst. Do you realize that he began, and it and, and wasn't like he just started uh, living a selfish life, he began to give money to his family. He gave money to charity, gave money to a church, I believe, Began to, you know, just kind of enjoy this uh, newfound riches, and it kind of made him a popular guy. In 20 months, $30 million, in 20 months, he was dead broke. Before there was a couple of months left, he committed suicide, and he's dead. Now, he wasn't on that path before he won that $30 million. That money wasn't a blessing. That money was a curse. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying any time that somebody comes into a windfall, not from the lottery, because that is a wrong, but God may allow you to come into some money, that might be, and if you have God first and it's in his proper place, you can still put God in his place. But if that begins to dominate your life, you've got a false reliance. Now you understand as a Christian today, we have a focus. Seek first the kingdom of God. It comes down to my priorities. I make decisions. Does God take precedent? Am I worried about my testimony? Worried about uh, what if I miss out? You're not going to miss out if you put him first. It's fruitful because all these things will be added to you. And it's foreign. The world doesn't know it. But there's only one thing that will give you peace, joy, contentment, and eternal life. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's have a word of prayer today. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. We're going to have prayer. Perhaps you're here today and maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus personally as your Savior. Maybe you've never received him. Maybe you know about him. You're familiar with him, but you don't have the assurance today that you're on your way to heaven. I'd love to remember you in the prayer. I'm not going to point you out. I'm not going to embarrass you. I wouldn't do that. But I'd love to remember a raised hand. If you'd say, I just don't have that assurance that my sins are forgiven, that I'm on my way to heaven. But I want you to pray for me. I wonder if by a raised hand, my heads are bowed. If you'll say, yes, remember me in that prayer. I'm not sure I'm saved. Anyone like that at all? Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed, and God knows who you are, and I'll just remember a raised hand in the prayer. Could be some folks watching by way of live stream this morning, and you have the same need. I can't see your hand, but that makes no difference. God knows who you are. Maybe as a Christian today, you know you're saved, on your way to heaven, but maybe God has put his finger on some things that are trying to take his place. Maybe he's reminded you this morning that he needs to be first. I don't know how God may have spoken to you, but could I remember you as a Christian today? If God spoke to your heart and you'd say, I need his grace. I need help in this area. Would you pray for me? Could I pray for you by a raised hand? Anyone like that at all? Heads are bowed. Thank you. I see those. Yes, thank you. God, we'd ask you to work in all our hearts this morning. You know the need. You know where we stand before you. Lord, I don't doubt this morning that many of us would like to put you first and we're distracted. There's others who've become so distracted that you've not become their priority. And though they're saved, you're just important, but not first. Lord, there's others this morning, perhaps, who do have you first, and they're seeing you add to their life. Lord, I pray for those that don't know you this morning. Anyone who doesn't know Christ, I pray you'd make it clear to him or her that she or he needs Christ. Thank you, Lord, for working in our midst. Lead in the invitation in Jesus' name. Let's stand with our...